Welcome to A Remarkable Feat, Life-Changing Disability Tech. I'm Jocelyn Cohen, Vice President of Communications and Engagement with Cerebral Palsy Alliance Research Foundation. This webinar is closed caption enabled and I've turned on transcription. For additional accessibility, I'll share a visual description of myself. I'm a white woman with dark brown shoulder length hair that's down and brown eyes. I'm wearing large blue green glasses and a purple long sleeve shirt. Sometimes I might look like my eyes are looking away from the screen or rolling, but that's part of my cerebral palsy. At our webinar last month, I spoke with Michael Perlmutter, CPARP's executive director, about how we've expanded our mission to include innovation and implementation along with research. That's when we announced the launch of Remarkable US, the first nonprofit funded disability technology startup accelerator supporting life changing technology to power up the potential of people with cerebral palsy and other disabilities in the United States. Remarkable US works in partnership with Remarkable, a transformative Australia based startup accelerator made possible by Cerebral Palsy Alliance. And since its formal inception in 2016, nearly 50 disability tech startups have come through the Remarkable Accelerator. Disabled people worldwide need technology that's affordable and accessible, and those are two of the foundational principles behind Remarkable. I'm so glad that Pete Horsley, Remarkable's accomplished founder, is joining us tonight to share more about Remarkable, including unveiling the three US-based members of the 2022 Remarkable cohort. And because we're having a special technology night, our executive director, Michael Perlmutter, has a front row seat to the action too. So you can chime in different parts of the conversation, but welcome Pete. Um, before you start, can you please share a visual description of yourself for audience accessibility? And I'll ask the same of Michael once you're done. Absolutely, and thanks uh, Jocelyn, it's so good to be with you. So I'm uh, a white male um, in my mid forties. Uh, today I'm wearing a black t-shirt with a remarkable logo on the pocket. Uh, I often wear hats. Uh, it's a bit of a trademark of mine. I have brown eyes and my uh, pronouns are he and him. Uh, my pronouns are she and her, so I'll add that in there too. And Michael, if you want to go ahead. I am also a bald white male in his 40s. Uh, I do not wear a hat, but I am wearing also a black shirt. My pronouns are he and him. Okay. So my first um, substantive questions, uh, Pete, you know, Remarkable fills such a crucial need in the disability space. And before we get into what's happening right now, I think it's important to reflect and look at how it all began. So can you tell me how you first got the idea for Remarkable? Yeah, well, it, it actually kind of built off a couple of interesting things that um, colleagues of mine um, were helping to drive in Australia. So in, in um, the early 2010s, uh, Cerebral Palsy Alliance um, got together with a whole bunch of different organisations around the world to, to bring together a day um, celebrating cerebral palsy, uh, World Cerebral Palsy Day. And uh, as part of that, we didn't want it just to be a day for a day's sake. We wanted uh, the day to actually count for something and mean something. And so we actually originally ran that as a, a competition and we called it Change My World in One Minute. It wasn't that it, immediate action was going to happen in one minute, but um, it was about being able to state problems that, um, and challenges and areas and ways that, um, that uh, we could change potentially the world for people with cerebral palsy. Um, in a very short period of time. And um, so we consulted very, very widely with the, the CP community across the world. And um, one example of that, uh, I think that, that um, is, is kind of part of the DNA of what, of what Remarkable has come, uh, is that a, a man by the name of Alpa, um, who was living in a small country town uh, called Bursa in Turkey, uh, he uh, said the thing that would change his world is if someone could create a solar powered wheelchair. It was an interesting kind of concept. We didn't kind of think too much more of it, but the way that the, the platform um, for World Cerebral Palsy Day worked was that it allowed input from the CP community all over the world. And, and lots of people voted for that one and said, that's a really great concept. And Alper had told us that uh, at the time he was stuck in this kind of catch-22 situation. And, and I think it's actually... Um, uh, something that, that um, uh, provides a bit of a picture of where technology is at around the world. And that was that he was stuck in this um, situation of where he could afford to live was actually outside of town. Uh, where all the jobs were, of course, were in town. 
Um, but of course, to get into uh, town, he needed um, a way of transporting himself in there and, and wasn't able to access any accessible transport. Um, did have a powered chair, but it didn't hold enough charge mm. uh, to actually get him all the way into town and, get, and to get him back again. And, and, uh, and so it, uh, in order to kind of pay for a new wheelchair, he needed the job, but he didn't have the job because he couldn't actually get into the city and, and get to where the jobs were. Uh, he also told us that there was a temple that he, he would love to worship at on, on the other side of town. And again, that limited his life. And I think that this is a, a real of technology around the world. The World Health Organization talks about that only one in 10 uh, people of the billion people around the world who do have disability who require one or more assistive devices um, have access to it. So only 10%, only there's 900 million people who are currently without these essential assistive devices that allow them to live, work, work play um, um, around the world. And um, anyway, so we, we did put this out to the worldwide maker community. Um, there's, there's universities, there's maker communities kind of all around the world. And we actually had a university in the States that, that took up the mantle. It was a university in Virginia uh, that said, yeah, we can make that solar powered wheelchair. And so we awarded them some prize money as part of that and, uh, and then gave them some, some money to be able to ship the prototype over to Alpa. And literally within a day of him receiving that wheelchair, um, we received a, a photo uh, from Alper and he said, this is the temple that I wanted to worship. Uh, and about six weeks later, he said, I've got a part-time job. And so this was, trans this was technology transforming the life of one person. Mm -hmm. um, and we really wanted to understand how do we do that at scale? How do we not just impact the life of one Alper? How do we actually impact the lives of, of thousands, if not millions of people around the world? And, and so that, that kind of seeded, I guess, the, the, um, the, the beginnings of what, what has now become remarkable. We really wanted to see it not just go to one person, but how do we do that at scale? And we thought that the best way to do that is actually through business. So that's a little bit of how, how remarkable came to be. I love that story for several reasons. And one of them is that aside from... Um, saying that this wheelchair would help him get a job. It was also to help him live other parts of his life. I think a lot of times we focus on very much like I need to get to work. And so that's the thing I need. And we're thinking of people, and this is not even just in the disability community. This is in general. We tend to think of people as whatever dimension we know them through, or just as a one dimensional person. And that happens a lot with with disabled folks where we're flattened down to the one dimension of our disability that we wouldn't have all these other aspects to our lives. Um, and that's one thing that excites me very much about Remarkable because it's not just, oh, these are utilitarian things to help you do necessary things. You know, these are, these are technologies to help you live your life in all facets. And maybe you would use several different things that have come through the accelerator now, will come through the accelerator in the future or have come through the accelerator in the past. So I appreciate, you know, looking at disabled people as whole people. A hundred percent. Yeah. And, and we, the only way we can do that is, is really through co-design and through, through a deep understanding and, and um, you know, being part of, of this community, this incredible uh, rich community around the world. I appreciate that. Um, I'm just going to bring bring our friend Michael in here. You know, you talked a little bit about Remarkable the last time that we were we were talking, the last webinar. Um, but what excites you the most about the cohort of folks that are that are going through the accelerator right now? So we sort of teased back in March that of the eight companies going through the Remarkable Global cohort, three of them are right here in the U.S. Um, of those, what excites you the most? And it could be three things. It could be one thing about each organization. It could be something wider. What excites me about it? You, Michael, yeah. Okay, I just want to make sure the question's for me. It was I, you, sorry. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think the possibility, right? Like it's, it's not about one technology or one solution. It's about what this represents, which is the opportunity for people in the disability community to, to drive their own narrative. It's about people um, 
having opportunity to be founders when they never had the opportunity to be founders before. And it's, it's an opportunity for, um, for people to, to create their, so their own solutions that, that, that really address the, the problems that they are so uniquely aware of because of their lived experience. I mean, and I, when I look at the organizations that are in this entire cohort, whether they're in Australia or they're in the UK or they're in the United States, what I see is people who are stepping up, um, who are really um, either members of the disability community themselves or engaging members of the disability community in addressing some of the most, you know, most pressing problems around accessibility, affordability, mobility, communication. Um, and to your point earlier, living, everybody having the opportunity to live their lives. Um, and that doesn't just mean work. It also means live your personal life. It means live, you know, have the opportunity to be your true self, whatever that looks like. And if you're asking me what excites me, I'm, you know, asking me which of the companies is like asking me which of my kids I love the most. <laughs> but I, I, um, I, the opportunity, the possibility that this creates, and you know, I Pete is a friend, and and um, as are the folks at, at the other folks at CPA, and I, we're just grateful to get to be a part of this, um, and you know, to get to work with my friend Pete um, and Vivian and George and the other folks at Remarkable um, to to really live up to our mantra of changing what's possible for uh, for people with CP. I'm really excited about it too. And we've kind of thrown a lot of words around tonight, like disability tech startup accelerator. Pete, can you explain what exactly the accelerator is? Like who comes through it? What's done within it? What the whole process so that it has a little more meat on the bones? Yeah, it's a really great question, Joss. It's, um, so a, a startup accelerator essentially is a support program for companies that are at very quite still quite early stages. They're, um, uh, typically, we call uh, them post-product, post-revenue companies. So they've got a product. They've got something that customers can kind of feel or touch or, um, or be part of. Um, and they might have had a little bit of revenue um, already, but they're still really at those early stages of building a business. And um, uh, for anyone that's, that's either um, kind of met an entrepreneur or met someone at the very earliest stages, there are a lot of questions that are still kind of happening around their businesses. Uh, is this going to succeed? We hear a lot about the kind of the massive failure rates of, of startups. And, and part of that is because, there are a lot of unknowns with, um, with startups. And so um, what we do is we come around, we swarm around uh, those startups and we provide a whole um, uh, range of different levels of support. So part of that is around some capital injection into the companies um, uh, so that they can uh, build their business and build into the things that, um, that they need in order to be sustainable and successful. Um, but we also surround them with, uh, with, with mentors and coaches. So people who have um, experience um, and understanding of um, both business, startup and specialty areas within the, within the business as well. And this year we've, we've partnered with an organization called Open Inclusion. Um, they're really helping to bring uh, um, some of that um, uh, inclusive design process around this as well. Um, we've always had that in there, but in an unstructured way, this is really kind of bringing it into a structured form so that uh, they can do user testing, they can um, have a really good understanding of the, the, the correct building blocks for their business. And what we're really trying to do with this is, is um, with that support, is to um, project them into the future in, in, a, in a fast way. It's called an accelerator for a reason. Um, it's, it's not just a, a plod or a kind of, you know, something that just moves them along the path or yeah. guides them. It is literally trying to accelerate their development because for us, what we're trying to do is to get technology for disability into the hands of people with disability um, faster. So mm -hmm. we just want to see the impact happening yesterday. Um, and so if we can accelerate that, if we can um, support that development, uh, then well, we think we're doing a good thing. It's really, you know, getting the companies down the runway and then they take off. That's it. That's it. And oftentimes they're still putting the doors on and the windows in and those sorts of things. And, and, and we're trying to make quiet. sure that we're, yeah, that's right. And, yeah. and we're trying to make sure that they do that in the right, in the right way. 
Hey, hey Pete, I know I'm, I'm not really generally supposed to be asking questions of you, but I, I think that there's a lot of credit that goes out to you for assembling such a great coaching and mentor community. Um, and I wonder whether or not, you know, there's a tremendous diversity of skills that an entrepreneur has to have to launch a successful business related to their product, related to business models, related to understanding of the regulatory framework. I you know, I, I think a lot of the strength of this program is in the quality of the coaches and the mentors. And I just, I, I'd like to, you know, give you an opportunity to, to talk a little bit about that because the, these people are absolutely incredible. Yeah, we're, we're, we are. We are incredibly um, fortunate to be working with such high caliber people from all over the world. Um, people who are representing different areas of, of specialty support. So legal, accounting, finance, um, brand, marketing, um, uh, growth uh, and, and development, customer, um, and as you say, even the, the kind of really kind of deep tech uh, uh, understanding of regulatory, of, of um, design for manufacturing, of, of uh, distribution as well. So we, we really do lean on this community in a big way. And we're incredibly fortunate um, in that um, each of these people are really passionate about this, this mission as well. And they're giving their time freely. Um, they're doing this as volunteers, um, uh, giving their time pro bono. And really it, it, um, to get access to all of these um, consultants uh, around their business would be hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of support um, if they were to access them on their own. And, and we're able to, um, you know, through the, the, the great work of, of our team, uh, we're able to um, provide that support to them um, as part of this program, and and we're we're ably supported by Molly and Sam uh, in the in the US now, um, in, two incredible individuals who have had such a rich uh, history of of working in in uh, both disability and in technology and in venture capital, and um, yeah, we're just really fortunate to have uh, both Molly and Sam join the the remarkable team in the US. So we're excited to have them on our team too. And you mentioned that a lot of these mentors have, have deep experience in, in the disability field. And we've also talked a little bit about the open inclusion side of things. Are there other roles that people with disabilities play throughout the process, you know, as far as founders of the businesses or employees of the businesses? Yeah, we, we, we don't think that um, it's a, the right thing to just tick a box around um, around consultation with um, people with lived experience. We, we want to make sure that it is embedded into everything that we do. So um, that happens right from the, the very first kind of selection and screening process um, uh, all the way through um, to um, obviously offering opportunities for uh, people to participate as founders. Um, through mentoring as well. We have a number of our mentors who, who are disabled themselves. Um, and uh, uh, we, we're now also kind of running uh, a program that's allowing, it's in a pilot stage, but we're, we're now running a program, a fellowship program that actually allows uh, people with disability who might be interested in the entrepreneurial space to, um, to be exposed to that as well if they haven't had the opportunity there before. So, um, and, and really what uh, the, the partnership with Open Inclusion is, is helping uh, to, to, um, to manifest as well is that it's not just about um, uh, doing user testing kind of at the beginning stages and then kind of uh, closing the book on that and, and um, putting that to bed. It's actually about consultation all the way through in your go-to-market strategy and your marketing messages, in uh, your policies and principles of how you're actually creating your businesses as well. So there's really a, a deep embedding of inclusion all the way through the value chain. That's really fantastic because it's not something we hear about enough in the world. Um, we'll often see things created that look cool, but might not necessarily really fix an access need or meet an affordability need. And so I appreciate that access and affordability are real tenants of Remarkable and that you're, you know, you're rolling the roll, walking the walk, limping the limp, whatever you want to call it. When you say that there is inclusion involved, it's embedded throughout. And that's really crucial. Um, and it, it gives an extra amount of credit to, to the accelerator. And it's one of the reasons that I'm proud 
um, to be part of this organization and proud to be here while this launch is going on. So speaking of the launch, I'm going to ask this question of both of you. Um, we've already talked about how exciting 2022 is with the launch of Remarkable US. And so I just want everyone to know more about the, the companies within it. So there are there are eight companies, right? There are three in the US, there's one in the UK, and the remainder are in Australia. So Pete, if maybe you could talk to the global, the ones that are outside the US, and then maybe Michael can talk about the US ones. Yeah, I'd love to. And uh, it, it really is, it's uh, kind of a dream come true to be able to see uh, that this global partnership happening as well uh, with CPATH. And um, yeah, again, reiterate the things that Michael has already said of um, uh, we get to work with with friends, we get to, to um also see this impact kind of spread. And, and so it is exciting to have this global cohort this year. Um, so some of the companies that we've got, uh, one of them actually has, uh, has come through uh, another program that we're hoping to bring to, to the US as well called Designathon. Uh, that company is called Homeable and they're creating personalized, inclusive uh, smart home solutions to increase independence in the home, that uh, this, seeing the, the opportunity for um, smart home solutions to enable independence in, in the home. Uh, and yet some of those things are, are quite complex in terms of setting up and also quite nuanced in terms of what uh, an individual's needs are. So they're really meeting that need. Uh, the second is Neuroflux. Uh, they're the, the world's first wearable uh, to non-invasively monitor brain activity and blood flow alongside other vital uh, activity relevant to stroke and stroke rehab. So there we're trying to see a, a prevention of further disability um, or, or a worsening of, um, of uh, disability uh, due to stroke. Um, the third is uh, called Recovery VR. It provides fun and engaging uh, medication-free virtual reality application that motivates uh, more adherence to rehab opportunities or activities. We all know that when we're given rehab opportunities or activities by our, our physio, that sometimes we might not adhere to them as much as we possibly should. Mm -hmm. um, and this utilizes um, uh, um, using VR and a really engaging experience um, to enable that um, both in, in the home or in clinic. And it also, also provides measurement data and feedback to the clinician um, uh, uh, to be able to track. Um, and it also provides unlimited healthcare access during um, they've got a custom built uh, telehealth portal as well. Uh, and then uh, the last one in Australia is, is called Vacayet. So Vacayet is Australia's first audio tourism platform um, using storytelling to revolutionise travel for blind and low vision tourists. Uh, at the moment, tourism is quite a visual. Tourism uh, in terms of search around holidays is quite a visual experience. And so um, this is trying to open up that world to those uh, uh, of us who are blind and have low vision. Uh, and then the, the last company who's in the UK is called Exercise, started by two incredible Paralympians. Uh, the first complete fitness app uh, created specifically for people with um, various impairments. And so um, um, two in incredible founders, they've got a third co-founder on now and um, they're doing um, such amazing work around the world. And uh, um, so it's, it's incredibly exciting. And then we're also joined by um, some US companies. I'll let Michael explain those. Fantastic. Sure. And it's, it's, it's great to get a chance to work with Ali and the Accessorize team. I had the privilege of working with them in my old uh, line of work uh, when I worked in drug testing for the Olympics. So it's great to work with those guys again. Um, the three U.S.-based companies, uh, I'll start with Wearworks, um, based in New York, creators of the Wayband app and Wristband uh, to guide you to your destination using only vibrations. Um, it's intuitive, eyes-free, ears-free, and hands-free navigation experience. Um, the second company is Participant Assistive Products, uh, which is using advances in technology to make affordable assistive products, starting with wheelchairs and strollers. And the third one is Biomodem, uh, which is smart, wearable, lower limb robots to improve mobility in children with cerebral palsy. Um, and so we are... Uh, I echo Pete's excitement about the entire cohort, um, you know, excited uh, to work with all of them and to announce them today to the, to the general public. 
One of the things that I appreciate, not just about the US companies, but the Australian ones and the and accessor size in the UK is it, going back to what I said earlier, that it's sort of covering all these different dimensions of the lived experience of any person. Of course, someone who's disabled wants to go on a vacation. They yeah. should be able to find a place they want to go um, and not have to rely on their site to do so. And, you know, people don't expect to necessarily necessarily become disabled. Like no one really wants to think that you could get a stroke or need rehab, but in case you do, these are things to help you. Um, it, it shows that disability isn't a monolith. And while CP is the most common lifelong physical disability, and there are 18 million of us in the world and 1 million of us in the US, CP is not a monolith either. So I can see potentially with my non-tech eyes that things that were developed for other purposes might serve the CP community. You know, knowing a bit more about the Wayband with WearWorks that Michael mentioned, um, as someone with CP, it takes me so much concentration and energy to move through the world that I never want to have my phone out. I never really want to be listening to anything on my phone because I don't know who, what, where, when is coming from any direction toward me. So if something's going to vibrate on my wrist, that's one less thing I have to think about. So even if that device was created for visually impaired folks, I think it would serve anyone with a neurological injury that has to concentrate more when they're moving, it would serve them really well. And then, um, you know, it would also just serve people who don't want to take out their phones when they're walking in a neighborhood they haven't been in before. They're not going to walk into people like me, or they're not going to accidentally step off a curb or walk into a telephone pole. I've seen stuff like this happen. So the more we can do for everyone, whether they have visual impairment, CP, disability, not disability, like rising tide lifts all boats. And I love just seeing that here. Yeah, I, I have nothing to add to that. But it, it's hundred <laughs> percent. It, it's absolutely true, though. I mean, we when we're when companies are going through remarkable, they're not only thinking about things that people need, right? Those aren't the only things in a person's life, right? Certain things that you want are an important part of your life as well, and so mm -hmm. the ability to vacation for somebody who has a visual impairment or is blind is an absolutely critical part of your life, the same way as it is the ability to, to maneuver a curb, right? Mm -hmm. And so two of the companies that, you know, are going through this cohort address totally different parts of the experience of being visually impaired or blind, but no one is more important than the other, mm -hmm. right? And so being able to navigate and being able to take that vacation are both equally important parts of a person's life. You can do them at, you need to do them at the same time. Those yeah. two things like work together. Maybe, I don't know if you do collaborate with, we do collaboration between we, we do. The startups and yeah. the accelerator. But I mean, that feels like a natural fit to me. 100%, yeah. There's, and then, you know, getting uh, homeable into, into vacation rental homes, That that's a whole other, vacation rental homes, I could go, have a very long conversation about that and accessibility, what accessibility means in different parts of the world, but I will save that for another day. Um, the, <laughs> one of the companies that, that Michael mentioned, the participant assistive products, um, it's, an, it's affordable. It's like designed to be deeply affordable mobility aids. Is that correct? That's right. And, and customized. So one of the things that we do see with um, some of the low cost uh, wheelchairs out there is that they are a standard form. And, and for those of us who know the CP community um, quite well, we know that those um, uh, standardized kind of forms of wheelchairs aren't necessarily the best um, uh, to allow for, for mobility. So this is low cost and it's customizable so that it allows for the unique um, shape of, of everybody. So uh, um, they're an incredible organization and really have a passion to, um, to empower localized manufacturing around the world um, for those 70 million people who, who require a wheelchair um, in, in those settings. You know, it, I've said this before, but it, it is really making accessibility accessible because yeah. it's one thing to say that wheelchairs exist. It's another thing to be able to get them to the people who need them. 
And so if a mobility aid exists and someone can't get to it, or if a mobility aid exists and it causes pressure sores or other physical problems, then how much good is it doing? So even though I am not currently a wheelchair user, that really resonates with me because I've also seen so many, you know, GoFundMe, crowdfunding, all kinds of crowdsourcing just to be able to get a wheelchair, which is the way people get around the world. You shouldn't yeah. have to fund your ability to get down, get down your sidewalk and cross the street. So uh, absolutely that is incredibly yeah. exciting to me. And then biomodem, I'm obviously not a kid with CP, but I was one. And anything that can uh, sort of revolutionize therapies, make it easier, more effective, more efficient, maybe even more fun. If a kid is wearing a robotic anything on their leg, like that's a fun talking point that is not hard plastic with hinges and straps. Mm. So that is exciting to me too. And then that means that those kids potentially get a, a even better start than I did. That if they have early intervention and we're funding the research on early intervention, right? If they're having early intervention and then this technology comes in, you're giving them a leg up um, as they grow, and they're starting from a, from a better spot. So That's it. all of this is really energizing to me personally. Pete, I can tell it's like that for you. And I, Michael, I know it's like that for you. Um, we have about... 20 minutes left. I realized I didn't mention that people could put in a call for questions. I usually do that at the beginning, but as we're tech themed and had tech difficulties, I did not do that. So if anyone has any questions, either um, stick them in the Q and A section or add them in the chat box. Um, I, in the meantime- I, oh, I was just gonna say, I wanted to interrupt to give Pete a little bit more credit. Okay. So I, I think, <laughs> Go you know, Pete, um, I think one of the things that impressed me the most when we started having these conversations was the focus on practical solutions. I mean, everything that that Josh just hit on about, you know, affordable mobility devices, about um, about practical, but also enhancing uh, robotic tech that enables kids to do their physical therapy. These are real solutions, right? And mm -hmm. so you you in getting to know this process, right? You pick companies that get to go, that get to participate in this accelerator, at least in part based on the fact that these are, these are real solutions that the community has said that they want and that are being provided at an accessible, affordable cost. I mean, your, your goals, we've had these conversations before is for this technology to reach everybody, right? Mm. This, is, this isn't an opportunity to, to provide a you know one hundred thousand dollar exoskeleton that you know three people in the world can can afford, and I, I I just it it's the part that excites me the most. I have to be honest, is that this is really meant to be a solution by the disability community for the entire disability community, and I just wanted to I want to give you credit for that. I will also like you designed this right. This is this is your you know, this is your creation. So what, talk about why that's important to you and, and what you hope to achieve, like what this looks like when you, when you accomplish your goals. Yeah. And, and certainly, uh, I mean, I have to say that it, it hasn't been just me. It has been an incredible team of people, um, both uh, within the CPA organization and uh, people who have been in my team as well. Um, so it, it really has been, uh, you know, and there's, there, there've been people that I've, I've spoken to in the U S that have really shaped my thinking around this. Um, and, uh, and, and so it, it has been kind of a number of different building blocks that have allowed this, this in, incredible thing to, to begin. Um, so, uh, in terms of, I guess, some of the motivations, there's, there's probably a couple of, um, there's probably two main aspects to that. And, um, and one um, is, is quite personal to me of, of I grew up with a sister with a disability, quite a profound disability. So she was born blind. She's my older sister. Um, so she was born blind uh, and also uh, is autistic and, uh, and has an intellectual disability as well. And so I've grown up in and around disability, known kind of the, known some of the disability community and, and seen the incredible um, richness, I guess, um, of 
of um, my sister in my life, um, but then uh, kind of what she provides to others around her. And I guess I, I do see, um, and this is probably the second aspect of it, I, I see so many barriers that still exist for, um, for people to recognise the incredible gift um, that she is to the rest of the world. Um, and there are so many um, barriers that we, we put in place, even through technology. Like I'm usually a pretty glass half full kind of guy. Um, but one of the things that really irks me is, is seeing some of these technologies that are fundamental human rights like mobility. Um, and the one that really irks me is communication. So some of our communication devices that literally cost more than a small car. And I think, you know, for, for something as fundamental as communication, uh, and we're putting this barrier in there that says unless you can kind of pay you know, in, in Australia, $30,000, some of these are, um, uh, for, for something that when you actually pull apart the componentry of it, it's probably about $20 worth of hardware and plastic. And you just think, why have we arrived at this position where, um, where this is so fundamentally wrong? And there are a number of reasons around that. There are kind of challenges around distribution and market sizes and all of those sorts of things. But it requires some different thinking for us to be able to unlock this and to be able to push over those barriers and to enable the, the human potential that we know that is, is in and around all of us all of the time that, um, that is just, um, uh, you know, limited in so many ways because we have perception around disability and we have these, these kind of inherent barriers that have, been, that have been formed in society and in our technology as well. The, hearing that the $30,000 device <laughs> costs $20 gets my hackles up. So, I mean, I uh, sort of yeah. knew it, but just to hear it out loud is a whole other, whole other thing. Man, I have to take a second with that. Um, but one question I have, and then I see another one in the Q&A, um, they're sort of related. W one question is, can the general public currently access products of the startups that are in the remarkable accelerator and if so you know what's the best way for them to do that yeah so um, uh, the answer answer is absolutely yes uh, some of them are still going through kind of regulatory approval processes and so we have to kind of go through that um, and, and enable this to happen um, so uh, but uh, on the remarkable website there is a, a list of the portfolio through Remarkable and, and it has links to all so uh, you're able to, to access uh, them there uh, and um, we definitely want uh, the community to be supporting these startups um, and, and if it's not directly relevant to you are there other ways that, uh, that you might be able to through connections through finance through um, there's so many other ways that you might be able to support um, this technology coming to market. And I, I just want to echo that. Like we, this is not going to happen without the full engagement of the community. Um, these companies more than anything else need to, under, to understand and engage uh, with their, their um, communities, with their future customers, hopefully, with the people who are going to make these products better and bring them to market more effectively. Um, I know we get asked all the time, and I'm pretty sure that's the question that was asked in the chat, is like, how, how can we support? And I think one of the ways that you can support is to engage with Remarkable. One of the ways that you can support is to engage with the companies, right? These are, we work with all of these entrepreneurs regularly. They are amazing human beings. They are always open-minded and receptive to feedback. They, they want to provide the, the best solution. They're, they're, not, they're not in it to be that person with $20 worth of parts charging $30,000. They're in it to really, to, to understand and meet the needs. And so that engagement is absolutely critical um, to that success. And so I, if you're interested in learning more about Remarkable, I encourage you to contact you know, Pete or to contact um, Molly in the United States if, if you're, interested in learning about the companies, I encourage you to contact um, their, their founders and to contact the startups directly. Um, they, would, they would love nothing more than that. 
Yeah, we always talk about uh, that, you know, there's that saying that says it takes a village to raise a child and and uh, it, it's a little bit like that with startup as well. It actually takes mm-hmm. a village to raise a startup and 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 so we, we need all aspects of support around that um, and, and uh, you know, right from just even encouraging words, um, you know, with these startups to say, hey, you're doing a good thing and I really appreciate what you're doing all the way through to, uh, kind of the, the the stickier end of of finance and customers and connections. Um, so if there are uh, uh, things that people can bring, uh, we we really do appreciate that. Yeah, because it is one thing to be a person with an idea, a person, let's say, with a disability with an idea, and you might have six strengths, but creating and running a business requires not an infinite number of strengths, but closer to infinite than six. And yeah. so to have more people on your team and on your side and at your back to help you is important. So like if, if someone is listening to this and they're in any kind of industry that could help a startup like this, one of these startups succeed, that's important too. There, there are so many different ways um, to share your support. Yeah. And Absolutely. if you want to physically meet some of the entrepreneurs, by the way, I have to give a short plug that the, the, businesses that are based in the United States that are part of the Remarkable Accelerator um, cohort that are the US-based companies are gonna be in Chicago at the Ability Summit uh, in June. Um, I would encourage, if you're able to, you know, absolutely attend. You'll get to meet some of the entrepreneurs themselves. You'll get to uh, meet the folks that are involved with Remarkable. Um, and you know, we'd love to meet you in person. And so if you're, if you're able to be in Chicago and you know, or happen to live there, we would, we would love to meet you. Yeah, it really to is 26. one thing to see something and like see something on the, on your screen and in, in one or two dimensions and to, you know, experience it in person and learn the backstory of things is a whole other thing. Go ahead, Pete. Yeah. And uh, I think that, uh, you know, it really is about how do we, how do we spread the surface area of decision making and problem solving for these startups? So, you know, um, as you say, they are bringing certain skills and expertise into it, but they don't necessarily have everything that's required to, to build that business just yet. And so it's how do we spread that surface area of, of um, problem solving and decision making? Um, yeah, and the, the, the little plug for um, the um, Abilities Expo is, is June 24th to 26th in, in Chicago. Summer is coming, even though it still hasn't hit, apparently, the Midwest. I don't really understand what's going on over here. But I'm just grateful that we're going to have a face-to-face event. Oh, and that, I'm that too. That we're, we're back to being able to, you know, get on a plane and meet the entrepreneurs in person and interact with them and, and you know, the disability community that will be well represented at the, at the Ability Summit. Absolutely. Well, it has been a fantastic conversation with both of you. Um, If there's one thing I say a lot about people with disabilities and the disability space in general, it is that we adapt. Um, So that's what this evening has been, but that's also all of what Remarkable is. It's adapting and creating space for yourself where there hasn't been and help for yourself where there hasn't been. Um, So I appreciate Pete, your time early on a Friday morning um, Michael, your time late on a Thursday evening, magic of time zones. I always love it. Um, and thank you to everyone for joining and listening. Um, if you joined us late, we will have this on YouTube early next week. So you can watch the whole thing, learn more about it and share it with friends or folks, you know, who might be interested. Thanks again for joining us and have a great rest of your day or night.